Hello and welcome to your July edition of the Love My Read Book Club. I'm Vicky, head curator here at Love My Read, and I am so thrilled to be joined today by the author of one of my favourite books of the summer so far. In fact, one of my favourite books of 2021 so far, The Paper Palace and author Miranda Cowley-Heller. Hello, Miranda. Hello. <laughs> I think we find you in the Cape, in Cape Cod at the moment. Appropriately for the book, yes. You find me on the Cape at the moment and hence the... The beach, oh. the beach towels. <laughs> I, I tell you what, your book has given me such a profound jealousy of anyone um, on the Cape at the moment. I'm just going to move quickly on from that. Um, give our audience a bit of a spoiler alert warning and, and I guess dive in with our first question, which is why this story in particular? How did it come about? I hear that there were sort of a few books sitting in a drawer somewhere and then poetry lessons happened. Tell us more how, how, the, uh, how the book came about. Right. Um, well, poetry, le I mean, it wasn't poetry lessons, but yeah, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I've been writing poetry my, I, pretty much my entire life. Uh, but I was taking, I was working with this in this amazing course that mm -hmm. was about sort of undoing everything you'd ever learned to, to write. And that really got me to take this out of the drawer finally and open up the prose to be, I think the, the way in which poetry affected my writing definitely did was the, just the notion of writing from a sort of sleepier, dreamier place without intention. Yeah. And, um, for me with poetry, it's just the blank page and you have nothing's no intention. And so writing without intention became, uh, sort of saved me, let's put it that way, as a writer, because before that I was always like frontal lobe thinking, thinking, and it was so, yeah. and, you know, so did it give you a kind of freedom? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Amazing. And I, I kind of get the sense that you're as a writer quite interested in depths and things that lie below, you know, a person's exterior and then sort of what's going on in their story behind all of that. I mean, you meet Elle as an adulterer, I guess, at the start of the novel, and then we see all of this depth to her and her story unravel. I mean, is that was that where you kind of started with? this or how, like what was your starting point for the story right well certainly the notion of uh, I hope of depth in character is, is a good one uh to try to try for um I uh I would say that more that um I'm interested in what's unsaid as well as what's said and I think with Elle and all of the characters that I hope um they they emerge through moments so mm -hmm. you're not being told who they are. And I didn't know who they were when I started the book either. And so to that point, um, no, I had this idea of the structure. And I had a, th a basically when I was a, a, a kid, I became obsessed with this John Lennon quote, life is what happens when you're making other plans. Mm -hmm. And I put it in my journals and then the next journal and it transferred, you know, and then I got to, you know, 40 or something. And I thought, That's, I'm still doing that. <laughs> um, but then that notion of the life you have in your head. Yeah. Um, that you keep thinking, oh, but someday I'll live in Italy or something. You know, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah, yeah. And then the life that's actually, that you're actually living. And I thought that would be a really, really sort of interesting character to just a character trait I think we all have in a way, but to explore. And so the structure of, the life she has led as one woman's life story mm -hmm. and a life, a one, the same woman's life story told in a single day. That was the really the only I, sort of starting point um, for Ellen. And it made sense that it was about the what you dream of. Yeah. Um, and in her I case, a very hot, <laughs> Very hot and handsome guy, who she always, you know, who she always wanted to marry, and always, I think, yeah, believed she would if something hadn't, you know, separated them as children. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's it's brilliant how you start with the conundrum, you know, the is it Jonas, is it Peter, and then the way that it's sort of you're most presenting like the pros and cons of both through looking back at her life and working out how she got to this point did you did you know that that was the right way of organizing the story 
of kind of, you know, it being quite reflective and delving deep into those different kind of pathways that you could have taken? I, I think um, yes and no. So I think basically for me, uh, the idea of choice and having an impossible choice and being faced with two equal, it had to be equal. The men had to be mm-hmm. equally uh, powerful in her life, equally loved. Um, I've just always been fascinated by that thing of sort of what do you do? And I think it's probably quite universal that we've all been at a certain point in our lives where you have to make a decision. And in Elle's case, you know, this is a choice between um, two great loves, (coughs) but totally different futures. And, um, And so there's, there's no bad choice for her, which means there's no good choice for her. And and so what I wanted to sort of examine a real woman in her fifties, who's still sexual and powerful and strong, but who has suddenly come to this place. And what do you do? What do you do when you have no idea which direction to go and yet your Mm. life depends on it? Right. Mm. And so it, it raised a lot of questions and I'm much more interested, I guess, in questions than answers. Yeah. And it raised the kind of question of, you know, who do, who does Elle want to be at the end of the day? You know, what mm-hmm. parts of herself, you know, does she want to be true to? And can she live without, uh, can she live with regret? And if she could untether herself from sort of the social moral conundrums of it all, what would she do then? And so I kind of wanted to untether her by, by telling her life story. So you get, so the reader understands, I understand how she got to this day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's where your kind of your 24 hours and your, you know, 50 ish years, those kind of two time spans that are playing out in the book, the way that they collide like that, you know, so that we, gradually come to understand where, how she's arrived at the point she's at now. I mean, it means that we as the reader are like, well, I don't know what decision she should make. Exactly, Exactly. that's sort of the point, right? Because it's so easy to put a judgment on that kind of thing in our, you know, it it doesn't make her a bad person that she's done this. I mean, you might in the immediate thing of, you know, have this sort of, oh yes, she's just, had sex with somebody while her husband was inside talking to her, the somebody, Jonas's wife, right? I mean, that, that would seem, you know, to make her immediately one type of human. Mm. But I think life as we all know it is far more complicated than that. And yeah. I, you know, there's this um, Rumi quote that I'm going to get completely wrong, um, but, I, but the gist of it was always yeah. very interesting to me which was uh, the ideas, the idea of wrongdoing um, and the idea of right doing mm-hmm. beyond the, this is what it looks like, beyond the idea of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field and mm-hmm. I'll meet you there. Mm-hmm. I think that's sort of, that's who we are. You know, yeah. I think we all, that it sort of just says, we are these people and we have these experiences and this is how God, how El got here. And yeah, not just her choices, the things that were foisted on her, the choices she inherited from her mother, her grandmother, the sort of inheritance of choice as well. Mm. And I'd love to talk about um, the kind of filmic quality of the novel. I mean, of course, everyone's incredibly excited to learn that, you know, you're a former had a drama series at HBO with, you know, worked on The Sopranos and The Wire and goodness knows like how long the list would be. But how did that background kind of bring to bear on the creation of this story and of those different choices that kind of could have played out? How, like how did it affect the way that you created the novel? Right. I don't think it created, affected it at all, to be honest. I mean, my HBO, uh, my time there is sort of ancient history. That was a long mm-hmm. time ago. And yes, I've done production, producing and stuff since then. But I started out in the literary world. So, mm-hmm. um, and getting the job at HBO was almost a complete fluke. They wanted somebody to hire somebody with real TV experience and I had zero. Uh, 
and yet, so I think what I brought to bear to HBO was my literary background and and my interest in real storytelling. Mm -hmm. Those show and and so that was uh, something I know that I brought to the table there. In terms of then the flip side coming out of that, of course there are certain things um, I've always thought very visually, but I think dialogue hugely mm -hmm. important coming out of reading thousands and thousands and thousands of scripts because you realize in the good scripts, how people actually talk. Yeah. People do not talk. They don't answer the question typically that was the, was, an, was asked them, right? Or they don't listen right. to one another. They talk over one another and they don't say things. And in the script, there's so much that has to be unsaid that, that, that a director brings to life. You don't, you show me, don't tell me is the cardinal rule, right? And mm. that definitely affected this novel in terms of, because that, that uh, as I said earlier, it's the, the unsaid is, has, should have as much resonance, I feel, as the said. Mm. That's where I guess you can build some of your kind of realism from is that trying to mirror the conversations we actually have in real life as opposed to how they might play out in a story. Is yeah, that kind of what's implied, right? What's implied yeah. by, and then I would say probably through, not that I've ever been a director, but through a, the lens of sitting behind a camera watching you know, is, is then how do you visually show yeah those silences yeah yeah what yeah. metaphors are you can you you know are there metaphors you choose are there metaphors you don't that emerge i don't think anybody's well starts novel with a theme if you mm -hmm. do that you're sunk in my <laughs> opinion it has to it has to come out of it has to come out of of the you can't dig for it you have to find yeah. it okay that's really interesting and, and talking about kind of sitting by in the character and you mentioned your sort of very like sort of spatial imagination I do think you write in a way where you can always see the whole frame I just want to read this one extract on the far side of the pond an egg yolk sun rises out of the dense tree line like a hot air balloon slow graceful it hovers suspended for a moment before breaking free of its tethers the break of the dawn. In that instance, the smallest breeze shares the water, waiting the pond for another day. I mean, you've basically got kind of like background, mid-ground, foreground here. You're, you're painting the scene that, you know, like the actual frame that we see. Is that is that just always been the way that you kind of visualize in writing? Or did that come after your work in, in telly? Telly had nothing to do with it. I mean, the thing about telly is, it, it, it sounds glamorous, but the fact is it, it was a hard job that I did a long, long time ago and I loved when yeah. I was doing it. I grew up in a family of painters and artists. Ah, okay. I've spent my life around, around painting and uh, that probably, you know, I, then I, I went after, after HBO and before going back to the book, um, I went and got a degree in art history at UCLA. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, the, I think the flat canvas and perspective, you know, is, uh, fascinates me. The ability mm -hmm. to do that in a painting, which is, I think, really what you are describing, right? The, yeah, I guess it um, is more painterly it, than cinematic. Yeah, I, it, it, I, I think that's, comes, yeah, I think that's what I grew up in. That's the soup I grew up in. Um, so, and so in, I think the layering, let's say of Elle or Wallace or Nanette. So who, for those who haven't read it, you know, so there are these generations and the generations and how each generation's choices, love affairs, whatever, completely change the character of the, their child and so on, mm -hmm. or their grandchild. Um, those are again the triplicate perspectives and so I always there's an image that's early on about a fish jumps and these little and these concentric circles 
bleed out until it looks like nothing ever happened. Mm. That to me is probably more the importance of, of how to tell that story in terms of Elle's story. Yeah. It starts teeny when she's a baby, right? And then it gets, you begin to see the ripples in the pond and, the, and you get, and you, the reader, get perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love the way that you manage to use your setting, as you say, kind of bringing out the metaphors. You manage to use your setting to create urgency and mood and sometimes maybe kind of hint at what a character's feeling without having to say it. You know, like there's a lovely description of kind of birds tumbling through the sky. And at one point, a hummingbird is sort of like struggling against the tide of the breeze. And you get a sense of, yeah, that's how Elle is feeling right now. You know, it doesn't know what to do. It feels like there's all of this stuff going on. It's struggling against it. I mean, that's the... Did you kind of set out to, to write like that? Or is that just something that happened when you started writing? I think it come, came out of the writing. I didn't know what the story would be. I had no outline. I had nothing. From day to day, I never knew what was going to happen. I literally did not know what was going to happen. I did not make a choice for Elle. Yeah. Like, I didn't want to direct her because then it would be too obvious. I'd give it away by mistake or something. And then, so the characters sort of took on a life of their own and I followed them. Mm -hmm. One, the idea that was there about place, and I think place is so important in the way it shapes her, well, for all of us, but the way it, it uh, shapes her life, the way it, the indelibility of it, of this one safe place for her. Mm -hmm. And she's coming out of a, a divorced family, a broken family. And so I also wanted to sort of examine those issues because uh, I've Came up that I, that that comes out of my own you know that that sort of sense of needing one place that yeah. makes you feel tethered and strong. Mm -hmm. so absolutely, in that sense, yes. I I would say it was not necessarily conscious, but I would absolutely agree that the, the weather well the paper palace the place is by the end, the place that gives her the strength to recover finally and forgive herself finally and to understand and sort of the metaphor of that, of a, that, you know, that those cabins that are made of teensy pieces of paper pressed together are still standing after hurricanes and storms and yeah. years or whatever, that, that she's like that. Mm. that she recognize that we and she recognize there she is and there's been so many little bits of paper and some great some horrible but she's she's not a person of that she is a person of strength yeah and independent yeah. as a woman I think and that's um that's part of it and, and then also quickly I'll just say that yes absolutely I think the weather and the landscape but very much, you know, when she's in that moment, the storm you're describing, she's in a sense of absolute turmoil. Mm. And that tumult is mirrored outside. Mm. Just, that's very, I don't know if it was uh, intentional. I think that probably was that sense of this, a storm is breaking. Yeah. Be a storm breaking that night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But more at the very beginning, and I didn't think of it until much later, you know, she, in her first swim, she says, you know, she just loves the swim and, but, you know, and then suddenly the fear and she wants the safety of the shallows and where she can see the sandy bottom. But yeah. at the same time, she loves the fear and the thrumming of her heartbeat. And I think, and uh, uh, the thrumming is Jonas and the yep. safety of the shallows where she can see the sandy bottom is Peter in a way. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so we know immediately this is a woman divided. Yeah. And do you think, I mean, I'm interested when you were kind of talking about how essential the paper palace is, obviously, to the paper palace, the novel. Could that paper palace have been put, you know, picked up and put elsewhere or did it have to be Cape Cod and one of one of our subscribers actually um Caroline of reading books and sitting gin is quite interested to know like could this story have been told anywhere other than Cape Cod or did it have to be Cape Cod it didn't have to be Cape Cod 
Mm-hmm. Cape Cod is the, this place is in my bones. And so, you know, uh, it was, it's something that I could understand. And also to be fit, to be fair, I, for me, the reason is that Cape Cod is, or the outer Cape, this place, the backwoods really, not Cape Cod in general, um, is a character. And, mm-hmm. and it's the place I love most in the world. And I kind of, I just wanted to do sort of a pay in to, to, the, to, to that place. Having said that, it could be Vermont, it could be yeah. England, it could be Cornwall, it could be anywhere where a place is imbued in a character mm-hmm. and experience coming back to place, it. You know, and, and, and sort of, do you want to sort of ask those questions? like? I, you know, I hope my readers think, what would that place be for me? Mm. Right? What is the place that gives me strength? And that does not have to be a summer house. That could mm. just as easily be, you know, uh, I don't even know, the storeroom of the of the grocery store where you worked and fell in love. I mean, I don't know. Who yeah. knows? But yeah, there's yeah. a place that makes each of us, I think, um, feel strong, I hope. Yeah. Is it is it purely about being feeling strong or is it also because it's a place she's come back to again and again? Is it almost like a way that she can kind of measure out her life? You know, she can remember how she was at such and such an age. Yeah, because I don't think she's I I don't I mean, she's certainly a flawed character and she's not strong. So what I think I meant was it gives us a sense of security. Let's put it. Yes. Yeah, that, yeah, I think I misspoke in that sense. Um, I think um, she, the moments she, the the half of the horrors and traumas of her life have also happened in this place. Mm. Jonas <clears throat> is a creature; he could almost be, you know, let's sort of describe him as a woodland creature. He, he he's part of the actual landscape. Right, yeah. and I think to be for Elle to be su- suffused in this place was very important, um, and because it really is the place, because the the story isn't obviously only told there. The twenty four mm-hmm. hours is, but every summer this is the touchstone, and this is where yeah. horrible things happened that she survived, and great things happened, and etc. Um, and so, yeah, so it's a, it's complicated for her, but it's in her bones. Mm. And uh, you talk, you just kind of talked briefly there about trauma. Am I, I mean, you know, it's obviously she's got this kind of generational trauma that she's carried. Is that something that you, you know, you knew that this novel had to be about that, but it's a, interested in the legacy of trauma of how one generation can pass it on to the next is that I, I didn't mm, sorry to render, sorry finish your oh, question okay. I guess it's just did you know that you knew you wanted to write about that or did it play out as you were writing her story it completely played out I think uh, there's a line that tri- in the er- beginning of the book because it's not just about obviously these two men that's mm-hmm. very important. That's the train wreck, <laughs> right? <laughs> but um, it's as much about the women and her, the relationship between Ellen Anna, her sister, and her, yeah. with her mother, and so on. And honestly, I didn't know what any and what was going to happen. I am really interested in the notions of trauma and how it inscribes itself. Um, the line, it's the strangest little thing, but at the beginning, there's this moment toward the beginning of the novel when Peter, Elle's husband says, um, you know, oh, don't, like she says, well, mom, mom, you know, Wallace is gonna be pissed off kind of thing. And it's all, you know, those people, those mothers who just really punish you for the smallest, you know, just sort of yeah. silent treatment, right? And he says, oh, she'll be fine, you know? And she says, "My, it's true, my mother believes in the glass ceiling. Mm-hmm. And it was out of that line that I started to ask myself, oh, why? That's interesting. What happened to Wallace? What could have made Wallace that way? It's not just generational. She's a complicated woman. And I, and that's where that piece of, of, of Wallace's trauma came out. 
And, and as I was writing it, I began to think, uh, you know, her mother Nanette had also gone through her own kind of trauma. Yeah. As strange as it's, you know, and there's a, without giving too much story away, there's that slap. Mm. You know, there's a slap. And to me, that was this moment of um, women, it almost came out of like Jane Austen in a way. <laughs> these stories where the women of these generations are so, have no money of their own, have nothing. Yeah. So dependent on, so Nanette, the grandmother is completely, she has to, she has no choice but to choose her husband's side. And so there was a sort of, for me, that this moment of a slap and I thought, yeah, my God, you know, that's, mm. that's the, it's still a little bit the metaphor, right? <laughs> but, you know, so that, so that's, that's how that happened. And then of course I was interested to see that why that made Wallace different and then why that might have made Elle's relationship with her mother different. Would, yeah. because Wallace is a person who really has to write things off. She, mm. she has to go, yeah, yeah, that happened, right? Yeah. So, you know, oh, don't be ridiculous. Divorce is good for children. No. <laughs> Perfectly fine. You would have, what, what, you know, you know, un, in, you know I, you, I don't want you to be some namby pamby boring person. You know, pain is great, but every, but it's not necessarily that she believes that. It's that this is how who she developed into as her own mechanism. Mm. So, had she not had that not happened, would Elle have been able to go to her mother and talk to her? Would she, you know, all of these the intricacies, the trickle down emotional economics of these things are fascinating, right? Yeah, they shape us. Yeah, and I, I guess as well, it's kind of what shapes us as well is what we feel we can and can't say. I mean, what right. Conrad does is horrendous. But what's interesting is that it's an action that means that Elle doesn't speak out. And in kind of seeing what she feels like she can and she can't speak about, that in turn causes more events to happen. Right. I mean, it, it's just, I think it's brilliantly plotted. I love the fact that you've drawn out this um, sense of kind of like desire, but then also safety. I mean, with, with Jonas, the fact that um, he and Elle kind of share this really dark secret, I guess means that she would have to be incredibly vulnerable to choose him, to, to accept that, you know, they're going to have to confront this this secret that being with Jonas is going to mean that this secret is always in the kind of forefront of the mind I mean it's almost like the the trauma is there to kind of block that and so therefore Peter is safe is that like what you were going for or Mm, I think it's more to me um the the mystery of why now she's Mm -hmm. been in love with Jonas on some level for what, 30 years? They are best friends. They grow grown up together, even though there's they were separated, but now as adults, the couples are great friends. Why last night? Mm. And that I think there's a sort of emo- it's, it's a it's a low burn emotional mystery. That's what I was interested in following and discovering myself. Why? And why last night? And when you finally get to the reason of why last night, which you know we don't want to give away to too much, but if you, when you finally get to the, to the why, that's really at the very very end of the novel. So it takes a long time to understand why she walked out that door into the night. Yeah. But, but what she needs is absolution, and I think in fact what makes the, because until that moment, she does not even want to forgive herself. Mm -hmm. So she can't tell Peter because he'd forgive her because he's such a great guy and she knows he'd forgive her and she doesn't want to be forgiven. She she doesn't deserve to be forgiven. And I think, so I think in a way on the contrary, you know, there's there's a void between her, you know, there's a lie she has carried and there's a real weight in life I think of carrying a lie for everybody. And, and again, yeah. something that really, again, sort of emerged. I, I think all these things emerged for me. Yeah. 
and then I follow the thread. I think that really is interesting that there's a, you know, a, a real heaviness, right, in carrying a lie. I mean, I will just very briefly say one of my oldest best friends, but you know, was has been married four times and was constantly screwing it up and being unfaithful, right? And I just remember thinking, oh, she's so lucky. I mean, she just starts again. So she doesn't <laughs> carry any of the guilt, right? <laughs> and then starts again, again, you know? It's like, <laughs> she's not, she doesn't have to carry the lies with her. There's no heavy suitcase, right? And <laughs> she's carrying around in her life, whatever it is. Um, you know, I think she finally found <clears throat> real ultimate happiness. I mean, I know she did. <laughs> um, but it was just one of those thoughts I remembered having when I was sort of in my, I don't even know, when we were a certain age, I, and I remember saying it to her, I was like, oh, how relieving that must be for you. Yeah. <laughs> you just drop it and leave it behind. Elle can't drop it. Yeah. You know? And yeah, yeah. Uh, and am I right in thinking that you didn't know the end of the novel until you wrote it? Correct. I find that fascinating. I, I didn't decide, well, I didn't decide. I, I decided only to let her decide, to let Elle decide. Um, and I had no idea what she was gonna do. Um, I think ultimately the re there were pieces that started to begin to lead her in one direction or other at the very, very, very end, her conversation with her mother, um, her, the sex she has with her husband, you know, all there are pieces. Yeah. Um, she does not know when she wakes up in the morning. Yeah. I, I don't think at all. I mean, she does, she, she doesn't know. Um, I think I probably realized what she was going to do maybe two pages from the end. That was fantastic. So you almost created your characters and then just kind of let them play out their story, you know, see how they interacted with each other. Yeah, no, I followed them. Yeah. Completely. And the, and, and the I mean, the characters, you know, like Elle, who I love so much, um, is, uh, you know, so I mean, I would say Anna is the character I most relate to as a person who's most similar to me, let's put it that way. I, um, Elle, Elle, Elle is not so similar to me, but, um, you know, writing, finding the way a relationship develops, mm. finding, you know, the, and just to go back to that thing, the, when she first, when she finally or first sleeps with Peter, the last sentence of that is, and so we begin on a lie. Mm. And because, you know, and um, that, you know, you just find those pieces and you go, oh, that's what she's carrying. Yeah. And there's such a, I mean, you know, you're talking about that kind of, field beyond right and wrong there's such a sense of moral nuance to this story did you I mean it feels like you've managed to follow the stories of what could be right what could be wrong but you kind of just watch you just let it you know play out you just let the characters kind of you followed them you've seen them make their decisions and you've not been there to judge them is that right or did you yeah I think that's absolutely right I I really did not want to pass judgment um you know any you know if you read if you're reading it you can bring to it whatever judgment you want or feeling you want and I hope that anybody reading the novel does have their own feelings what was important to me was to understand how understand her dilemma by of course, at first you go, well, Peter's the greatest guy. Like why, you know, no way, Jonas, you know, but then you see her growing up with Jonas and you understand that and you think, well, obviously she's got it. You know, it's sort of the yeah. Heathcliff, there's maybe like a bit of the Heathcliff thing, right? Yeah. Um, but so, you know, so clearly she has to be with him. This is crazy, but then Peter's so amazing. And then you have these other, you know, and so you just kind of, what I wanted was for the moral piece of the choice to be superseded by the life experience piece of the choice. Mm -hmm. And people are calling this book a page turner, but I mean, it's also incredibly richly detailed, it's beautifully written, every word is made to count. 
do you think that we experience it as a page tenor because we're so engaged in this decision that she's got to make and so engaged in the those these moral questions which we can which we all see in our own lives do you think it's the emotion that we're you know is causing us to whip through in in a session or in a weekend I, I'm, you know, I certainly didn't think of it as a page turner when, yeah. I, when it took me seven billion years to write. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, <clears throat> I think that the propulsion of both stories, I think once the, once the story of, of Elle's life, life, mm. <laughs> once Jonas really enters that picture and, you know, there is a, that one has a momentum too. So you begin to ask the Peter Jonas question long before you get to that day, right? Yeah. I, I think that there's that. I also think that it's um, perhaps because of the structure, you know, you're not, it, you're not dragged, dragged down into the writing. You're allowed to, I, I hope sort of, you know, eat it up in a delicious way yeah, um, I, I think it's, it, it maintains its urgency throughout, which I think is why it's being, you know, in some publications being given the name Page Tenor because not because it kind of fits into that genre of sort of, um, you know, quick literature, but more because it's, you want to find out. And then when you get to the end and you're like, oh, you sort of realise that, yeah, this is where it was going to be headed. Yeah. I, I do, it's fantastic. So... I hear that you're adapting it for HBO, is that right? Um, yes, I am. Well, they bought exciting. the right to the, it's exciting if it, you know, it's TV, so. Yeah. But yeah, no, I, um, they bought the rights to the book as a mini series. Um, I'm, I've just written the first script and I'm, I'm gonna embark on the next couple of scripts. Um, What's uh, that like turning your, turning your work into a screenplay? I mean, are you having to change the story? Or I do want to change a lot, yeah. And I find yeah. that is both fascinating and challenging. And I've never written a script. Yeah. I've rewritten other people's bad scripts, but not, I've never, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> in my job, do you know what I mean? I have to get yeah, in. Yeah. But it, um, I, uh, I think it's hard, actually, because yeah. it, the book is so important to me. It's yeah. true that it's hard to have the kind of distance you know, I'm learning how to, and God knows I know not a lot about scripts, but I'm, I'm having to step away from certain things that are important to me in the characters because they want something else. But at the same time, I want to be true to the book. Mm. Because I think that's what people will feel that, you know, feel strongly about, I hope, you know. Um, and to that question of could it have been somewhere else, it's like look at Big Little Lies, you know, that yeah. set in you know California. It's it's the story, not the setting, as long as that works, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm 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 getting there. I think that I mean we'll see. I I, I can completely see it in my head as a miniseries, and, yeah. you know, and so it's kind of fun. It's definitely a challenge. Absolutely. And what does it mean for you for this novel to come at this point in your life? You know, you've had an incredibly successful career to date. Your novel, I guess, you know, you've worked on it for a number of years. It's arrived relatively late in your career. What does it mean for it to arrive now? You know, is it like a springboard to a, you know, this is what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life? Or did it feel right that it emerged now? I hope so. I mean, um... Yeah, all I can say is I'm thankful that I finished it when I was still in my 50s. <laughs> I've got to get it out there before. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, it's very, it, I wanted to, I started trying to write, you know, to write fiction when I was in my 20s. So the, I was always going to be a writer. I was always going to be in that world. My father is a writer and editor. My grandfather, you know, I have lots of writers. Mm -hmm. The other side of my family is all writers and editors. And, um, and I just could not get away from my fear of being bad. I, so mm -hmm. there, there's, I felt so much pressure and I know this is really common. I think it's really common for so many people trying to write 
and find their voice. It's, you know, but what if, what if? And in my particular case, I you know, didn't want to embarrass myself in front of various, you know, better family members, you know, <laughs> a little problem with that. Um, but I did write, and this one I did start a, quite a few years ago before I actually went back to it. Um, yeah. And um, what I will do next, I, I, I need to get back to the, the poetry unlocks from is what, what changed was that the more I invested and got published and, you know, in, in poetry and so the more I began to love the blank page. Mm -hmm. Whereas before that I thought, well, I have to know it all or, I'm, you know, what comes in, there was a fear of the blank page. Yeah. And then just going, just closing your eyes and going, I don't know what's coming, but they do. Somehow or other you're, somehow or other it's in, you know, it's in your, the back of your, it's in your unconscious somewhere. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, I think I'll probably go back to some poetry and then hopefully, you know, start another book. I mean, I hope this is, you know, what happens. Um, I stay away. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the intention. Let's put it that way. That's the intention. Aww. Amazing. Well, I mean, Miranda, I could talk to you for absolutely hours about your book. Um, I adored it. I thought it was just incredibly beautiful. I loved the nuance of it. Um, and so have our subscribers. So thank you for thank talking you. to us. Thank you. Um, and I should, <laughs> I should say that our viewers can get their hands on a copy of The Paper Palace now at lovemyread.com forward slash shop. Um, where they can also subscribe and um, more titles like this will be delivered straight to their doors every month. Thank you so much for watching and thank you so much again, Miranda. I look forward to your next book. Thank you. I, was, I loved talking to you and I just want to say to your readers quickly that I love, I mean, it means so much to me when I get these comments from people on Instagram who I don't know who tell me what it meant to them. I mean, it it's an amazing experience for me to have for the first time, you know, and, and I will say that it's, it does not get less exciting. Oh, that's such a lovely thing to hear. Oh, so I hope everybody reads it and likes it. What else can I say? <laughs>